What is up, down and sideways, you lovely individuals? Welcome back. It's Lee Gunlock, Eric, and Mark here with you guys. And I don't know what side of the bed you guys woke up on today, but Han will life woke up on the right side. They went right to their closet. They skipped through all the Hanwha Life jerseys and they said, there it is. The Gen G jersey because Doran, Delight, and Peanut today against T1. They were, not only were they all business, they were showing absolutely zero mercy on the rift. I'm calling this series the GG series. The ghost of G past. Either Gen G or maybe Griffin for your boy Viper down in the bottom lane popping off. Yes, sir. This was all across the board. 5v5 domination from the likes of Hanwha Life Esports fully prepared for T1 in this playoff series. Now let's actually break it down. We'll go game by game. Sweep across the board. These games were closer than 3-0 complete stomp starting in game one. It was, I think, a 4K gold lead at one point uh, for T1. And this is the Faker Corky win streak. That was something, it was almost 20 games in a row at this point. He'd won on this pick. We get the coveted uh, Corky Azir matchup. But it's Doran in Zeus's head on the Rek'Sai. We have this Jinx Thresh combo that we have seen Guma and Kyria absolutely annihilate teams with. But Guma doesn't get to play this game because Doran, every single team fight, saves his ulti for him after he flashes or after he gets the lantern, and he can't even auto anything. It starts all the way, pick and ban in that situation, of course, and you look at T1 opting in to that Jinx Thresh option in the bottom lane, passing over things like the Senna, like the Nautilus, giving that over to the side uh, of Hanwha Life, and especially that Pick five, our five pick of the Rex side coming in through into the top side. And that is the problem. That's where Doran finds himself, his advantages, and he keeps building them up just slowly, just little ones here or there as T1 is building up their, you know, gold lead throughout that game. But it gets to a point for that gold on T1, it ain't gonna matter one little bit because Doran is doing nasty things on this Rex side, keeping that ultimate just reserved perfectly pristine and placed only onto gumayushi and it's multiple team fights around the baron throughout a deficit and an even gold uh state where they just outplay t1 straight up in back-to-back -back team fights which does not happen very often with any teams uh doran obviously picks up mvp in that first game he had the highest kill participation on his team that never happens for top laners like this was crazy what was doran eating for breakfast is what i want to know Zeus, before getting apparently. <laughs> yes he was and he was eating good in that first game getting that early advantage on to game two where is the pivot what is the change for t1 they say we want that senna ourselves. they don't lock themselves the nautilus alongside it they go for the again a little bit more of that spice a little bit of the cooking that they have known and tried out they put kiria onto that scion the tanky boy and they keep the solo lanes the exact same. Win streak broken, be damned. It's another Corky game uh, for Faker because he was really the lone hope for them in that first game. But it's a not necessary dragon contest that ends up getting a couple of kills over to Zeri for Viper. And she's worse than Cassidy as a ticking time bomb when you pick up a couple of kills. This Zeri got completely out of control before even 20 minutes. The problem with Zeri starting to get out of control and getting gifted those two early kills in exchange for that dragon steal, that contest situation that was going on is, well, you look at it, T1 was in somewhat of a small, but you know, building up advantage early in that part. You give over that little advantage towards the Zeri and Zeri from that point on, getting that little bit of a taste of that sweetness at the beginning is off to the races to get her CS, to get the advantages that she needs to push push that advantage and any situation where it became a 5v4 once you created that opportunity for yourself as Hanwha Life that Zeri is hounding onto the enemy team and making sure that you aren't getting out of there without giving over some extra gold another killer two to the side of Hanwha Life 
And eventually, there was just no way that you could see T1 winning this set, especially as soon as Viper so quickly is building defensive items. He's got a Scimitar and then a GA by like 35 minutes. Even if you're killing the Zeri, there's no chance. I'm surprised it even took Gen G almost 40 minutes to close out this second game. Yeah, that's the thing that I think overall the takeaway number one is wow that was really impressive from Hanwha Life but of course number two you're like well maybe you could have done this even faster because there were a couple of slip-ups a couple of mistakes which T1 does take advantage of to get themselves into some position where they can provide that type of you know pushback that counter but at the end of the day in this game too the big menace out of all these ones we were talking about was that Nautilus because that Nautilus was everywhere. He was not just in the bottom lane. He was not just in the mid lane. He wasn't in your top lane. He wasn't just in your jungle. He was in your base and he was in the river and he was in your, you know, uh, wolf camp, whatever. He was everywhere, man. And th that had to be cosplay Nautilus because there's no way the real Nautilus moving around the map with that big heavy iron armor, he had to be made out of that styrofoam foam to get that fast. He's just floating with the underwater uh, skins. He doesn't even need to touch the ground. And game three, it only gets worse because some of the hooks Delight were landing were absolutely nutty. I was questioning, where the hell is he throwing this hook? And then he pixel perfect max range is catching somebody on T1. Guma and Kyria get this lethal Callista Rumble bot lane in first rotation and pick ban, and they get absolutely bodied by Viper and Delight for a third straight game. And even the early game in this one goes the way of Guma and Kyria. They get gifted a, a pretty early opportunity where Peanut uh, makes a mistake, doesn't realize, doesn't check, of course, like a lot of people do. The damage that is possible from that Rumble support early gets burned to a crisp. Guma gets a little bit more advantages in that bottom lane. At one point, you know, kind of 10 minutes in, you're looking at this from that T1 angle until Hanwha Life activates and they find themselves their team fights. They find a way through their little advantages here, little advantages there. T1 is still in this one. Uh, again, close like the majority of these games had been providing that pushback. At a certain point, right around that 20 minute mark, Hanwha Life finds a way to crack it open. And it's when uh, Doran finally starts playing the game because him and Zeus were both 0 0 0 for about 20 plus minutes of this game. And just when T1 is sneaking their way back into this game, that Aatrox firmly slams the door in their face. Yeah, the rest of T1 is finally coming online. They're finding their way to stall out and get their engages, start these fights their way. Heck, they're starting to really turn it around and get the advantage of it in the bottom lane. Oh, wait, the Aatrox is still alive. Yes, he's missing four out of five Qs in his rotation, but he absolutely is still alive. And he's making sure that it's going to be him at the end of the day standing at your Nexus. That's just Aatrox things. Don't even need to land those sweet spots uh, to still be able to carry a team fight. But I mean, almost a kill per minute, 29 kills in 31 minutes for Hanwa in that third game to complete the sweep. Other big thing to note from this series is every single game, at least two, more often than not, three bands going the way of Peanut. And it doesn't matter. He picks up nine kills on the Xin Zhao in that third game, even with that little whoopsie early on. Yeah, even with that little whoopsie, which is still letting us know that, yeah, you're watching Peanut, of course, keeping yeah. that in track with, with those type of things going on. But you better believe that, yes, you're watching the legendary LCK Peanut when you're talking about the way that he has performed, what he is providing in his role for this Hanwha Life team. I think, of course, we you know are talking big time about the success of Doran, about Viper in this series. Heck, even Zekka had his moments of the positive stuff outside of, of course, you, you can't escape the horrible flash alt engage he tried on the owner in game two. That, that has to. I've never be. seen Kyria make a play like that. I, never. We're, uh, he throw Kyria's, uh, yeah, the Scion one into that one too. Of course, the mistake coming through. This is what you're talking about in this series was really Peanut helping out the rest of Hanwha Life get online. But man, these guys, once they're online, they took it to the show. And I mean, across the board, Every individual matchup, they outplayed their counterpart. Like we said, the Gen G buff is there. But uh, even though Zekka, you know, wasn't his greatest series, and this was probably the closest head-to-head -head match between him and Faker, but definitely the other four members absolutely playing out of their minds. Can't wait for a Gen G Civil War matchup in the next round of LCK playoffs. We're not here 
to make excuses for T1. And I don't think Faker was meaning to use this as an excuse either, but we got to touch on now. We've obviously had so many issues of DDoS attacks in the LCK throughout the split. They are started playing offline to counteract, but now it's impacting specific teams even more. And Faker talked about it saying, it's not really fair that we can't play solo queue. And his main account, Zeus's main account, they haven't touched solo queue in two weeks. Sure, they've probably got alternate accounts that they're trying to dodge these DDoS attacks to try and play, but Faker never goes two weeks without playing solo queue. Yeah, this is a situation I think where a lot of people and, you know, the translations might pick it up as an excuse. I feel like it's more just something being brought to the attention uh, in this type of case for T1, you know, kind of there was all this talk about the DDoS attacks and especially how it affected these LCK live games and everything else. But of course, knowing that it was a deeper issue and what was going on and a more continuous issue for the LCK, even as we returned back to the arena to play, T1, of course, out of all the organizations, gonna be the most affected, the most popular, the most targeted in this situation. And yes, that practice that you're mentioning, that just that familiarity, that comfort that you're gonna have from playing that type of time and, and routine for these players, disrupted by that. And that is absolutely gonna have an effect. And this isn't, remember, this is an LCS solo queue. This is an NA solo queue where guys don't even play because the practice isn't worth it. LCK serious business and guys are actually, you know, testing different builds, different matchups, different skill sets and things that they're going to implement on stage. So not being able to do it and it's affecting some of their scrims too. Like, what are they supposed to do? It, it's, it's a really tough situation. I think at the end of the day, most of their competitors are going to go, well, tough luck. We'll see you on the rift and we'll try playing you still with all of our practice and yeah. all of our times not being as affected the way that you are. That's just the way life goes in these type of situations. But I do like that it was at least, and I think especially from the leadership perspective of Faker being that brand, being that one to step up and bring the attention to that, I think is an, a decent acknowledgement. And at the very least, maybe at, at, at the bare minimum for the T1 fans to hear that and to acknowledge that and hear that from their players can maybe help them be in a better frame of mind to understand just how underprepared or what type of odds they were against, actually, when you realize the rematch that they had against Hanwha Life. And Faker making a comment should be alarms going off for Riot. Okay, if the GOAT's talking, we got to listen and pour more resources to make sure that this gets shored up. But again, got to say, didn't matter if they had practice on the day. Humble Life absolutely deserved this win, absolutely bodied them across the board. But T1 season isn't over, so this needs to be sorted out so they can be on the same practice level as every other team in the LCK. Season match point on the line for NIP versus FPX. And they say, we're not even going to just cook up some spicy picks. We're going back into the time machine because we don't want to deal with life's rumble in the bot lane. So we're going back to season five and lane swapping in 2024? In my lord and savior year of 2024, yes, we're getting some lane swaps going on. And yes, it's making a difference in this one and making an advantage big time. That unrecoverable advantage. FPX had no idea how to deal with it incredible that this comes out and it is the it's the kill shot it's the nail in the coffin for nip for this series to eliminate fpx insane stuff going on in the lpl this one is a is a great series to dive into and how about also that fourth game you get the diana pick coming out of care haven't seen that in like four plus years he lands up with a pretty rough looking score line but my man gets a five man pull ulti in on diana and it doesn't even matter because no one can follow up. You're immediately like screaming when you see that play. And then it's just the, oh, it, it doesn't there was, matter. <laughs> it doesn't, it's still crazy to see you get everybody in that move. Yes, uh, this series was, of course, our, our match that we've had before. And we've dubbed the Fred Bowl, but because it has been d d d describing to us who is the fraud of the LPL, who was going to be the real contender the dark horse all these things in the playoffs at the end of the day after all this time nip knew that it would come down to this and they were prepared for it on the day and you better believe 
Not only was your boy, the big dog, the big carry rookie, ready in the mid lane, but he got his backup from the rest of this squad, especially your man Shanji in the top side, I think, had a fantastic series. Yeah, how about pretty much the only guy in the world making Udyr actually look lethal, especially in that fourth game. He did it on the rec side, which we've seen lots of people, but multiple picks. He was really uh, playing at that level that we used to hype him up on uh, when he was on OMG. Yeah, and so this was obviously a very good continuation of that and really good to see that one come through and bloom as that development, as this NIP team looks to go further in these playoffs to have that angle for this team. It's one of those things where we talked about it with OMG, talk about it with NIP right here. You have to have that multiple threat on your team, especially with people knowing and having played and prepared quite a long time against someone like Rookie. They can dial it in, and if they get to put all their efforts on to shutting that down, there's a pretty good chance that they might find a way for it. But if you provide that you are an option, you are a threat that needs to be cared about, that's where it starts to become a little bit more difficult for teams to operate and manage and prioritize the resources against you. That's when this team, NIP, can be one of the more lethal options in the LPL. The question for us is, does this A, on the FPX side, diminish all of the great things that we saw and, and earned from Milky Ways, especially uh, specifically in this one? No, not really. I we still had moments on uh, the Lee Sin where there were glimpses of, man, this guy is, is a star. There is that baseline that has already been established and built on that is going to be now expanded on as we move through the summer split and hope to see more from him in this FBX team. I think it does also then bring up the second question. Was this dominant enough from NIP that you feel like they are a true contender in the LPL? And when I say true contender, I'm just ta talking about that base level contender, no fraud status. I'm talking about true contender where you can stack up to your next opponent, Mr. Billy Billy Gaming. I mean, they've leveled up, I would say, big time this series, even from what we got out of World Elite in their first round. You got to level up exponentially now because the the growth from FPX to BLG might be the biggest single series jump you'll see in the history of the LPL playoffs. I'll be honest with you. I don't think there's enough level ups in the single new game plus new game save. You got to go to new game plus to get a couple extra of these ones for NIP to get onto BLG's level. Uh, it's one of those ones where you somewhat check yourself because you want to be cautious and not overhype something like BLG and, and what can, you know, knowing what can happen any given day, these type of things in a series. But BLG is a colossal titan that you are staring down, and that shadow is mighty long as NIP faces off into the next round. It's a classic. Does momentum actually have an impact in the LPL playoffs? If you're NIP feeling great after back-to-back -back series wins, whereas BLG's been sitting at home, leaning back, waiting for their opponent, I feel like it's been hit or miss. Sometimes we've seen JDG come in a little flat when they have a bye. Other times we've seen them just completely demolish 3-0, a team that went through the entire bracket. Yeah, and I, and I think we've also seen teams that go through the bracket and don't necessarily pick up that momentum as you're talking about. They don't really feel them themselves and get hype it all the way through it. And as you mentioned, there are certainly are teams that do find that relaxation, that rust, that things that settle in and be, create that little bit of a difference from when you are battle tested and ready and hard and ready all the way through these playoffs. That's the question. Is NIP on that path? Are they the ones that seem like they are going to sharpen themselves up? Or is it just simply another meal in the place for BLG? Other bit of crazy news that's been ongoing that we haven't really talked about heading towards MSI. We're used to Vietnam, the VCS, being that cream of the crop minor region heading into international events. But whew, heading into playoffs match fit fixing scandals across the board most of the teams being implemented so much so that heading into playoffs they just immediately axed two of the teams they went six to four and all four of these teams when you see the roster none are immune they've got emergency role swaps coming in substitutes coaches coming out of retirement players that haven't played in a couple of years getting on the rift how are any of these teams going to compete internationally it's absolutely bonkers because you go through some of these lineups and you're like, remember that guy? He's, you know, was here like a year or two ago or, you know, something like this type of situation. And then you start having guys like your boy Optimus in the mid lane coming in through last playing in 2019. Boys, that's 
five whole years ago. Is the game the time. same? <laughs> what did the map even look like in 2019? I can't Holy remember. cow, this is crazy that we're getting your boy Optimus back out there and some of these other names that we are seeing and just the desperation really in the scene right now to get these these rosters filled out with guys that aren't going to be, you know, maybe investigated, taken out in these type of situations and everything else that's playing out. At the end of the day, we're still seeing that brand of VCS League of Legends. It is still absolutely... And even more so, it's even more chaos. Yes, sir. It is chaos central, and we're seeing some wacky, inexcusable things happen as well out there on the rift. Specifically, uh, this series that happens today, we're talking about what happens if the mid lane on the enemy team goes 9 0 and one type of situation? Do you want to roll the dice on facing that exact same mid laner again? Because you better believe that's what's happening in the VCS. All you need now is the buff to have your actual starting mid laner that you had and signed to the team. And they're going to dumpster through playoffs because they might be playing against a guy who hasn't played in a couple of years. SFM's coming in and he's playing support. He was the coach. He's role swapping or unretiring to not even play his main role. If you need a break from the rigidity of the LCK or the standardness that you might see of the LEC or the LCS, absolutely take a trip to check in on the VCS right now. And, and take a look gonna... at a team that's going to take a win from FlyQuest at MSI. <laughs> yeah, you better believe there's going to be some upsets going on like that. And the LCS, numero uno in that lineup. It really is too bad, though, because it felt like for so many years we were climbing the VCS to that honest to goodness major region, at least LCS level status. But the last couple years, they have really fallen off that cliff. And the problem is as well, not only just the Rift performance and the differences there has fluctuated and actually has, as you mentioned, gone down a little bit in recent years uh, from the trend that we were on. You go to then all the other kind of wonky little things and stories happening from the region as well and the management and what help is going on. This is on. enough to kill the league entirely. Absolutely. And I think that that was kind of the path that it was on in this sense. I think right now kind of people are enjoying the novelty of how much they've scrambled and patched it together to get some of these matches and series at least out the door. You better believe that it is alarm bells ringing still for the VCS. I can hear them ringing from all the way over here. But that's it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauty. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.